imagine a cow, imagine a cow of spherical density, you know, imagine a spherical cow of uniform density on a frictionless plane. That's where we'll start. Well, no, that's how most people do photography and optics. They come up with these really simplified models that just don't work in the world. Uh, and part of the problem is that the world is very complicated. And the other part of the problem, which I'm going to go into a little bit here, is that you are never ever dealing with information with data that hasn't been highly massaged. Uh, I, I'm not going to quibble about the definition of computational photography, but for the purpose of the conversation here, it's anything where the computer is getting heavily between you and the original data, and it's doing obscure and sometimes unbelievable things to it to produce a photograph that you like better. <laughs> No, uh, this is actually more serious than you think. Um, even if you're working in raw, even if you think you're working in as clean a data as you can imagine, you're not. It's already been heavily modified. Um, I've, I've got a wonderful example here I'm gonna bring up in a second. There's, a, there's a, a nice little program out there called Fast Raw Viewer, created by one of these internet mavens who knows way more about raw than I ever will. Um, possibly not more than Jeff Shu, but more than I ever will. And um, he just wrote this program, which is the simplest thing he could come up with that would take the raw signal from the camera and co convert it into a viewable image. It does the minimum amount of calculations that you can go through a lot of photographs really fast. And I have a nice little comparison here that shows what that does, what kind of image that produces compared to what Adobe Camera Raw does with all the sliders set to zero, all the modifications that I can eliminate, eliminated. And let me grab that image. And it's quite wonderful. Just a sec. You think you think it's not impacting your raw when you set it to zero, but you know that that's not true. <laughs> exactly, and that's the point here, um, is that there's all that stuff going on under the hood, the secret sauce. What I was saying, here's something, now this is actually from 10 years ago, so ACR has gotten even better. On the left, this is a highly magnified section of a photograph, and on the left is the way it's interpreted by Fast Raw Viewer. On the right is the way it's interpreted by Adobe Camera Raw. And this is, as I said, with everything zeroed out as much as I can, which as Jeff pointed out, is not really zeroed out. Um, you know, just pointing out a couple of things. Notice how Adobe Camera Raw manages to figure out that the edges of the light sources should actually be clean and sharp. Notice also what happens in the braiding in the cables. Adobe mm -hmm. Camera, uh, Camera Raw is managing to figure out what the braiding looks like, whereas Fast Raw Viewer just shows a mass of pixels. I do not know how Adobe Camera Raw is doing that. That, by the way, is real. That's not synthesized information in the sense most of us would use it. I have a bunch of photographs made at that location, and this is really what the cables did look like. Uh, in addition, if you look closely, if you pixel peep, um, you can see that the grain is smoother. The noise is smoother in the Adobe image than it is in, a, in the um, fast raw viewer. It's managing to module, it is mad, ma managing to deal with the chroma noise a lot better. And this is what you would call a straight interpretation over here. It's not close to straight. This is even before all the tweaks that Adobe's added in the last 10 years, plus you start playing around with any of the corrections. So when you think you're dealing with you know, nice, clean, raw data, you are never dealing with nice, clean, raw data. And that means any simple physics assumptions you make, yeah, not so much. Um, comments or questions at this point? Um, so there is one way to actually see the raw data and you have to use uh, um, the ACR, I mean, the, the DNG um, uh, application, the DNG converter app and use terminal and you can actually do a command line control to take a raw file and have it rendered as an RGB or as a as a undemosaic, um, um, basically sensor dump 
you can Ooh. actually, you, you can do that. Um, there's not much use for it. Uh, one of the things, well, I mean, it's interesting to be able to look at what your actual sensor capture looks like before it's been demosaic. De um, but then the other thing I was going to say is that uh, under the hood, Thomas is making some assumptions. Uh, there is default noise reduction and sharpening being applied, even if you don't apply it in the control panel. Um, chromatic noise, um, uh, chromatic uh, color noise reduction is being applied by default. Um, and if you actually turn it down to zero, you'll see how bad the color noise. Uh, I, I keep, uh, I've got an old Canon uh, D10 uh, that is a particularly great uh, camera for really lousy, noisy images at high ISO. And so if I want to do an example of how fucked up an image can really look like, I, I do a sample shot. Um, but what I was going to say is that what Thomas is doing is a what he calls a normalized procedure, the tone curve, the color adjustments, and um, sharpening and noise reduction <clears throat> are always done to a default level under the hood, <clears throat> even if you have all the numbers set to zero. So like I said, the only way you can actually get it is use the DNG converter. And it's interesting to look at it because it is a dark, linear, mm -hmm. um, uh, greenish <clears throat> looking, because there are more green than um, uh, red and blue. Uh, but it is interesting. And in my digital negative book, I've got a, a recipe for how to do that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and as far as I know, this is going to be true with any decent raw converter you use. It's not Adobe Camera Raw. Anything that gives you a decent looking image is massaging the data very heavily, just in different yep. ways. Yep. Uh, you're, and, and Jeff has gotten to another point that I want to get to, which is, this is another thing that people say online, uh, you know, when they're arguing about something is, no, that's a bad idea because you're losing data or you're sacrificing data or some such thing. Well, in human terms, data is not information. Information is, is stuff that's meaningful to us. Data is just what comes out of the sensor. <clears throat> and pretty much any time you manipulate the information, even including adjusting the color balance so that you actually get a gray instead of a dark green, you're throwing away data to do that in at least one channel. And you're doing it to produce something that conveys better and more useful information to you. So you know, there's another one, people who just go on about preserving the data. Well. As Jeff said, the best way to do that is to bring up this totally unmosaic raw image. And you know, good luck getting a good picture out of that. Now, let me go on to another example. This is great. Uh, Alex Burr came up with this one, testing some 85 millimeter lenses. Yeah, you're not um, sharing. No, not yet. OK. For, for Petapixel. Um, I'm, I'm doing the preview. Um, huh. Depth of field. Everyone understands depth of field, right? I mean. That's just simple mathematics. Any high school student can Circle derive it. Circle of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> That's a group of photographers sitting around a table talking about depth of field. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, and any, any smart high school student can derive the equations. They're very straightforward. Uh, the trouble is they don't work very well in the real world. Okay, are you, are you seeing yep. Um, yep. the portrait? There it is. Okay, great. Now. What he was doing here was testing uh, two 85 millimeter lenses from Canon. Um, it, the, the details don't matter. Um, they are slightly different. They're different in design, which is why the field of view here looks slightly different. Don't worry about that. But he had both of them set to F2. So this is this, this is both lens. These are two 85 millimeters from Canon on the same camera, the same setup, both set to F2. Do they look like they have the same depth of field? I shouldn't even have to blow that up <laughs> to tell you. No, they really don't. There's more than a stop effective difference between them. And that's because even depth of field isn't simple. I'm gonna switch back to me now. Hang on. Okay, stop share.
Okay. And again, these are from Alex Barrera. I Alex actually Barrera, talked to him. Yeah, yeah I talked Petapixel. to him and got permission to use the, the files here. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're from Petapixel, um, which frequently turns up really cool stuff. And I know a lot of people diss Petapixel because it runs lots of clickbait. And you should all understand it's a commercial site. It's designed to make money. <laughs> That's what it's for. So you know you can skip over the click, clickbait articles and then get to the good ones. Um, <laughs> But you know, don't fault them for what they're trying to do. Uh, they're not trying to be a scholarly journal, but they run a lot of cool stuff. And I ran across this there. Okay, so here's the problem. Those wonderful depth of field equations we talk about, um, they're based on geometric optics. They assume light rays come in, you know, they just go nice little triangles, they focus to a point, they defocus again, you know, like that. It's all the equations are all similar triangles, really easy stuff. The problem is in the real world, that's not what optics do. The light rays don't actually come to a point. They actually sort of come in and you know they get close to each other and then they spread out again because there's a resolution limit involved. So rather than being two triangles crossing, it's more like the neck of an hourglass. And the shape of that neck totally depends upon the optical design. And some have really sharp necks, and some have really shallow necks, and some are asymmetric. In fact, back in the 80s, Canon or Nikon designed a lens where you could alter the depth of field. You could shift it from the front to the back of the plane of focus by turning a ring. I don't know if they ever sold any of these, but you could actually move it around. I think I have one of those. <laughs> oh, really? The 135? I know Canon made a 135 adjustable yeah. soft focus. I have that. You, you have that. Oh, amazing. I don't know how to use it, though. <laughs> All right. So, so they sold at least one of them. Good. <laughs> because it was a cool thing. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the point of all of this is that people who say, well, it's even as simple as depth of field, it never is. And as, as Jeff pointed out, it's a great way to cause confusion, you know, is to start discussing depth of field. I'm bringing these up as examples of why physics isn't simple. And even this isn't simple. Um, all right, where do I want to go from here? So on that 85 millimeter is designed, is it, does where the aperture appears within the elements, the actual physical aperture affect how the depth of field is going to be because it changes the exit and entrance pupils size? I have no idea. Oh, okay. I'm not, a, I, I cannot do optical design. <laughs> I can only look at the designs and go, wow, they're really different. But <laughs> I can't analyze them. Okay. I want to. I, can I would like to interject something. Yeah. Sure. Years ago, in the pre-digital era, uh, I, I know that you could take nine lenses exactly the same. All right. Let's say a hundred millimeter. Make life easy. A hundred millimeter lens from Nikon and do, do testing for depth of field and depth of focus, okay? And color, a lot of other stuff. And you could come away with eight of the nine lenses that were completely different than the one that you like. So I- You're remember, talking about the same, same model lens, not different manufacturers. No, 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 no. Same exact yeah, this, lens okay. from the same exact manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether it was Nikon or or uh, right. Canon no, I just wanted to clear that it was Leica, just... or Leica or whatever. And and so photographers um, in the photo district in Manhattan, we would go into Forty uh, Seventh Street Photo or you know one of them like that and say, let me see all of the focal length lenses of a particular manufacturer, let's say um, 85 millimeter, all right? And um, we would try to get one that actually gave the individual photographer the depth of field and the depth of focus that they were used to. Well, how do you measure depth of focus? I mean, that's where the film plane is. Depth of focus is you set the you set the cat you set the lens up at a certain uh, 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 subject to film plane, 
okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, 45 degree angle, three feet away, and you look to see on the yardstick where the most, and, and the lens is wide open, okay? You look to see where the number on the yardstick is the, is the sharpest, okay? That's your point of focus. You take the next lens and you put it on there, and that point of focus, because you haven't moved anything, that point of focus could be an inch in front or an inch back. And yeah. Can, mm-hmm. this right? is, no, this is all. Um, it, anybody who wants to dive into this stuff should read should read the technical blogs on lens rent on lens rentals. Um, Roger, is it Chicola? Chicola? I don't know how to pronounce his name. I only read it. But Roger is like the ultimate geek these days on this subject. He's like a cross between Arthur Kramer and Norm Rothschild. Uh, And he has access to dozens and dozens of the same samples of lenses. So he runs these kind of comparisons. And the answer is, yeah, no two lenses behave the same. They just don't. Uh, Back in the 80s, I tested a whole bunch of enlarging lenses, trying to find the best ones. And I had multiple samples. And even with enlarging lenses, which are optically about as simple as you can get and mechanically really simple, they don't even focus internally. There were variations with those from the best manufacturers. Right. Um, Right. Yeah, this this all further confounds the issue. But sample variation is normal. That That just exists. But it does. It, it should make you suspicious of anyone who tests a single item and draws broad conclusions from it, which unfortunately all of us have to do because none of us are in Roger's enviable position of being able to get 12 samples of something and have the time to test them all. He does this because he likes it. He thinks it's fun. Um, I'm glad it's his kink. Me, I would just like to get the article done um, and get it out. Okay, um, I'm going to go on here and, and talk about something else now. Um, well, I should see further questions or comments. Let me back up to your prior sure. point. Yeah. Uh, we often hear photographers uh, say, well, it's right out of the camera. And <laughs> you're the same reaction I've got. It's you like blew that no... one away in the, first, in the first share. Yeah, that's, you know, again, that's the simplistic thing. I, you know, I, it's uh, I try to explain that it's a you know it's a lens with a, with a computer attached to it, so there mm-hmm. really is no point at which something is right out of the camera, other than what they they're something they're happy with or they stop doing. Typically, it's an excuse for just it's a bad photograph, and they go, "Oh, well, it's just right out of the camera." But um, there really is no such thing as right out of a camera. You're always subject to some manipulation or manipulating it yourself. Is that correct in a simplistic way? Yeah, it's not even simplistic. That is utterly correct. This is, this is what I was demonstrating and, and Jeff confirmed when I showed you that comparison between fast raw viewer, which isn't even right out of the camera, but is much less manipulation in ACR. And as Jeff pointed out, if you look at what's right out of the camera, it looks horrible. The color is totally wrong. Uh, the, infra- the data is there, but the data has to be massaged. Um, I, I, I want to go back and expand on something I, I went past quickly, which was that everything loses you data. Uh, let's suppose you photographed a gray card in a scene, and the color temperature of the light is actually what matches the sensor. Uh, so, you know. So say this is the level you get on the green pixel and this is the level you get on the red pixel and it comes out gray. Under any other color temperature except that one, they're gonna be offset. And one of the things you do when you correct the color temperature is you bring them back into alignment. Well, as soon as you reduce the reported signal on this particular pixel, you're throwing away low order bits. You just have to, the information isn't there. You know, if originally, if you had a value of a thousand here and you reduce it to 500, well, you've lost the bit off the bottom. So you always, in fact, lose data. There's no way to avoid it unless you actually like looking at those undemosaic files that Jeff told us how to get access to. 
yeah, there's just no way to avoid massaging if you want a photograph that looks good. You're never looking at what's straight out of the camera. Oh, by the way, understand here, we're talking about raw in all of this. If you're looking at JPEGs that are generated by the camera, oh my God, the amount <laughs> of secret sauce that goes into those are amazing. There you really are in the realm of computational photography. Absolutely. We're not even talking about that. Uh, and so they're great. You guys want to see what a raw dump actually looks like? Oh, can you pull one up fast? Yeah. Here, oh, let, let me share my screen. Wonderful. Hang on. I got to make um, You'll have to. Yeah, I that just screen. did. Okay. Share. I'm so glad you're here, Jeff. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I was tickled to death to see you uh, uh, as the, uh, uh, the next victim. I mean, sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, you guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay, so on the upper left hand oh, yes. uh, is the image that was, well, it, it, it's not at default, but I mean, it's kind of um, normalized, run through camera raw uh, and looks normal. Uh, the next dark black and white is literally the linear dump of the RGG, RGGB sensor. And if you look over to the far right, you'll see this uh, 01, 02B. This can't, is actually a 3200% um, zoom can't. in on the actual sensor dump. So it's red, green, green, blue. Um, the lower left hand black and white is the same as the um, linear black and white, but it's been normalized for contrast. And the image on the lower right uh, of the full image is what it would look like with no color adjustments at all. Now this was shot at daylight. I mean, it was outdoor light. And so this is what a color image would look like if you just did a straight demosaicing to take the RGGB and turn it into RGB pixels. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, 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 and so the upper left-hand color image, even though it's essentially at default and every manufacturer of software will have different defaults, um, although Lightroom and Camera Raw's defaults are the same, um, Capture One and Camera Raw's defaults are different. And the interesting thing is that a lot of people look at Camera Raw or Capture One, and they say, well, Capture One is better at raw processing than Camera Raw. And I would tell them, no, you ignorant slut. That's <laughs> not true. Um, what uh, can be said accurately is that by default, Capture One does an optimization. That is their underlying principle and philosophy is to try to make the capture look as good as possible. And that's a perfectly legitimate way of approaching. Uh, and the, you, you might understand why they do that. Their under, uh, underlying the Capture One software is that they're a hardware manufacturer. They sell cameras. Mm -hmm. So their software is designed to make their cameras look good, right? Same thing with Nikon uh, uh, Capture and uh, Canon's horrible, terrible, fucked up software that uh, Canon uh, foists on the unassuming uh, uh, unwashed masses. <laughs> but Thomas Knoll took the approach since he was being a right neutral um, developer. In other words, he didn't want to have one camera be more fine-tuned and optimized versus another camera. Uh, his approach was to normalize everything. So when he does the underlying reverse engineering of the raw file, what he's primarily concerned about is to normalize the results so that um, uh, you know, from camera to camera and manufacturer to manufacturer, the same underlying photograph will look similar. In other words, the contrast, the sharpening, the noise reduction, 
um, the white balance, all kind of have been normalized. Well, you can understand that a hardware manufacturer or camera manufacturer would be particularly peeved at that because that means Nikon and Canon end up looking a lot uh, more similar, uh, which is one of the fundamental problems that Thomas and, and Adobe has had dealing with camera manufacturers is that they want their own cameras to look better than the competitors and camera raw is designed to make them all look the same. So mm -hmm. that's all I got. Sort of yeah, the Starbucks uh, any, thing, make the yeah, coffee now, taste I, I wanna, equally I wanna bad. Point out, I want to point out something also on the images Jeff brought up there, which is between uh, the, the second and third, the two black and whites, there's some, there's some curve shaping that goes on in there. You know, that's something you could do in Photoshop with a curves adjustment layer. Yes, uh, from, from this one to this one, a, a tone curve has been applied to basically um, do a gamma adjustment. Right. And, and a ga gamma adjustment makes the curve steeper in some parts and shallower in others. It's yes. not a straight line curve. No. And, and this goes back also to what I said about you're throwing away data because when you make the curve shallower, you end up losing some low order bits. It's unavoidable. Now, when you're working with a 16-bit de depth, you don't really care. That's the whole point. But you do throw away stuff. Um, well, I keep, I keep I, harping I on this argue... because you'll keep, you'll keep running across people who say it's all about the data. No, it, no, it's yeah. not. I want to add one more thing, which is what Jeff is talking about is also why it takes a while for the raw converter manufacturers to come out with profiles for new cameras because every camera handles the data differently internally. They have different ways they define the ISO. They have different preferred transform curves. And it takes a while to integrate that data in to your program, especially since in many cases, the camera manufacturers don't actually want to tell someone like Adobe what they're doing. Adobe has to, re sometimes they do, and other times Adobe has to reverse engineer it. So this is why you don't instantly get new raw converter models, because there's actually a lot of engineering that has to go on to make them work. Um, one thing I'd say in argument to your point about um, uh, uh, wasting data, it's, it's not so much wasting data, it's really spending data. Yes. It yes. takes data to do something computationally. And exactly. you, you spend that data, and I would argue you should spend it wisely, not waste it. Oh, I love that. Yes, excellent. Okay, so spend your data wisely. <laughs> Don't waste your data. And a lot of people waste their data. Oh, yeah. Uh, particularly people that like the out-of-camera JPEG. Well, they just wasted about 70% oh, of the potential because they're getting a gamma-adjusted image instead of linear. So the headroom in the highlights have been chopped off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing is every time you do a color change, a color transform, um, it's, it's basically uh, spending data. You're using data to make the, the transform. And if you wanted to be uh, uh, one of the reasons that I tell people that, that um, the best color space to use in Photoshop for image processing raw images is to take your image and open it in Profoto RGB in 16-bit because Profoto is the only color space that can contain all of the camera colors and contain all the colors that your printers can print. Um, so what ends up happening is the, the, the numbnuts that think the out-of-camera JPEGs are somehow sacrosanct um, they're they're basically praying to a false god. So how? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, well, one thing I wanted to mention, you reminded me of talking about all of this is, you know, these transform curves that go on. Um, many years ago, when uh, I, I I've been using Olympus cameras for some years, I got a new Olympus camera, a new OM camera, and it the old one had pretty lousy exposure range, like 10, a little over 10 stops. Haha, <laughs> we think that's lousy these days. Remember back to slide film. Anyway, uh, and the new one I got had 12 stops. 
So I sat down to compare them and did step-by-step -step comparisons to look to see what it looked like. And the transform curves were very different. In the shadows below middle gray, the two cameras tracked identically. And what Olympus had done was designed a transform curve where above middle gray, those extra two stops were allotted to the highlights. It was actually a differently shaped curve. This is up to the camera manufacturers to decide what they want to do with that. Uh, but it's a really good example of the fact that, yeah, different cameras, different raw, it comes out very, very differently. I thought and, that Olympus was now owned by a different company. They yeah. still use the name. Yeah, that's only about care. a month old. Yeah, I don't care. It's an Olympus camera. Yeah, Mine says okay. Olympus no, you're on right. it. You're, yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know at some point we're going to get new cameras that won't be called Olympuses. I'll, <laughs> I'll worry about that when I buy a new camera. <laughs> Hey, if I could add a, a comment here, um, you know, the, the things, this is Joe, by the way, the things you're saying about the difference between original data and then useful information, these transformations have to happen. I think something very, something we forget is that our eyes and brains do something very similar, which is, you know, there's obviously there's light striking our retina, but the perception that we have of what we see is highly uh, modified by whatever all these things are going on in our head. And the idea that seeing is believing is, is kind of a, a similar sort of, uh, not so much, because really what we see is what our mind creates out of some much more abstracted data. I just think there's an interesting comparison there between our eyes and the camera. Well, right. And, and this is why I qualified when I said information early on, I, I, I qualified it by saying what's meaningful to us, because this is not actually definable in terms of information science. This is a psychophysical problem. You know, it's what looks good. And I love Jeff's comment about, you know, spend your data wisely. You have to spend data the same way you have to spend money, but spend it wisely. And what you get out of that is that another example of this is simple. Um, if any of you have cameras which have a high resolution mode, like the Sony's or the Olympus's, where they actually step the sensor by half pixel increments and get a whole bunch of photographs and then put them and then do an analysis to create a higher resolution image. Well, what they're doing at each step is one of the things they're doing is a differential operation. They step it by half a pixel and subtract the two signals and that tells them how much it changes. That subtraction loses you low order bits but it gains you spatial information that you didn't have before. You're spending your data wisely. And, that, and, and it really does work. Uh, that's another one, by the way, where you see what some of the stuff that goes on under the hood and the problems that arise, which get into noise, which is gonna be my next topic, which is one of the biggest improvements in those HR photographs is the noise is much, much lower. It's not so much that the resolution improves. They all look like they were made with large format sensors. And that's because what, what those cameras are doing is they're collecting RGB data for every single pixel they want to render instead of using the interpolation method that you use on a bare array. The problem with that method is it produces chroma noise because you're taking two adjacent signals and to divide, derive color, you have to subtract them. I mean, a neutral gray, there's no difference. If there's a pastel, there's a little bit of difference and that difference is what makes color. So you're subtracting two numbers, but you don't subtract noise when you do that. The relative amount of noise goes up. Really? Yeah. Um, and that's where chroma noise tends to come from. If you accept at very high ISOs, but you know, I'm talking about even at low ISOs. When you actually collect full RGB data at every location, you don't do that subtraction. Um, if, you ever, if you have a camera that does HR, do what I'm saying, you know, make a picture at a nice low ISO, like 100, 200, do the same thing in HR mode, zoom in on them on the screen and look at how much cleaner the HR one looks, even down in the shadows. Again, data being used differently to get you more information. Okay, um, I want to talk about noise now, because this is a fun one. and. Let me see, what do I want to start with here? Let me think about this. Okay, okay. One of the big things you see coming up in the it's just physics or it's simple mathematics arguments is about how if you've got stuff deep down in the shadows or very little light, you don't have a lot of gray levels to work with because you know, binary. 
you know, goes one, two, three, four, and everything's quantized. You know, you've got only a few bits there, so you don't have many gray levels to work with. And this is a big argument that people raise all the time about why shadows look crappy. Um, no, you don't. Actually, you have any number of gray levels in there, and it's because of noise, unavoidable noise. All systems have noise in them. There's all kinds of noise in digital cameras. Um, everyone talks about uh, what they call uh, counting statistic noise, Poisson distribution, that if you've got really low light levels, the photons don't come in in lockstep. They come in as a spray. So sometimes you get more and sometimes you get less. That's one source of noise. There's also thermal noise in a sensor. There's amplifier noise, there's readout noise. These all have different characteristics. Uh, John pointed me to a photo that Andrew Rodney put online showing one particular camera where the, no where the chroma noise was worse at ISO 100 than at ISO 800. Unfortunately, I don't have any details about the camera, so I can't explain oh. to you. Okay, I'm gonna talk about why noise is a good thing, why you should be glad there is noise in your systems. And to do that, I'm going to bring up a share screen again, and I'm gonna have to explain what you're looking at because it's not obvious uh what it is hang on let me get to the right one uh da, 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 just a sec here no not that one not that one uh, one of these frames is not like the others <laughs> uh, i think that's the one i want let's see if this works let me she pull up the share screens again. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, what you should be seeing now is a bunch of grayscales. Are you seeing that? Yes. Okay, very good, fine. At the top, okay, and they're not gonna look quite right on your screen because we're dealing with you know, limited bandwidth and internet. So, you know, take my word for it. At, at the top of the screen, what you're seeing is a continuous tone gradient. Well, it would be if we had 16-bit displays. We don't. But it starts out as a continuous tone gradient from, from, from white to black. I'm taking a section of that here and blowing it up. You know, think the, it's, it's the lower 10%. And you still can't see much. Uh, but what I'm going to do is now amplify it. And this is what happens when you quantize it. Think of the same thing with the bright, with, with the contrast turned way up. These, these are contour lines. Those are not lines of spatial detail. It's like what you saw, what you'd see if you took a JPEG of a blue sky and blew it up on the screen. You'd see these contour bands because of quantization. And this is what people are always complaining about, uh, screwing things up. I then took this little, this middle image here and injected a very low level of noise into it. Um, similar to what you'd get from amplifier noise in a digital camera, and then converted it to 8-bit. And this is what you get, the lower pattern. The quantization goes away because the, no the noise moves bits up and down a little bit randomly. And it means there's a higher probability of getting one value than another, but it's probabilistic. This is what we would call continuous tone. It's noisy continuous tone, but it's continuous tone. It does limit what you can see, um, but we we know this from the film days. Um, you know, if you if you made a photograph in thirty five millimeter on HP five and made the same photograph in four by five on Pan F, the the large format photograph has much nicer tonality, much finer gradation. You can see subtleties a lot better because there's lower noise. So you are limited in what you see, but these so-called quantization problems that people talk about, the digitizing problem of only having binary bits, it doesn't exist in the real world. Every image has continuous tone. Now, 
it's true at higher brightness levels, the noise has less impact and you see finer tonal gradations. But this is another case where the it's just physics, it's just math doesn't work. I'll, sh I'll show you a better one even. Let me switch again. Hang on, let me pull it up. Uh, Wait, before you leave, let me ask you a question. Oh, oh, sure. So in the bottom graph, all right, mm -hmm. the top part is without noise and the bottom half of it is with noise. Exactly. It's otherwise exactly the same thing. And then in both cases, I quantized it down to eight bits from 16. Okay, okay. Yeah. And that's why I need to explain it because it's hard to illustrate this. I mean, without... that's, very, that's very dramatic from a visual point of view. And remember, it's vastly expanded. All of this stuff is way down in the shadows. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the original one, you're looking from charcoal black to dead black. I just expanded it there to show you what's going on deep down in the shadows. Uh, but it's also why, you know, if you take a digital image and you really open your shadows way, way up, you don't see quantization bands. You see a lot of noise, but you don't see quantization bands. Well, if you do, it's because the, your readout electronics are crappy. That's a different okay. problem. <laughs> well, one, other one other question. Sure. So is this type of, is this similar to the concept that we did in the, the film days where you would expose for the shadows, but process for the highlights? No, not really, because that, for one thing, that's, that's negative film you're talking about. And okay. digital cameras behave a lot more like slide film. When you hit the, when you hit the pure white point, you're dead. Okay. You, run out of, you run out of places to put data, you get clipping. It's, you know, in, in slide, in, in, in negative film, yeah, you want to expose for the, in negative film, you expose for the shadows because you wouldn't ever blow out the highlights. Mm -hmm. In digital cameras and slides, you overexpose and there go your highlights. Right. Um, which is one of the things that makes imp implementing in practice exposed to the right difficult to do. So it would you much, do it the, so would you do it the opposite way? Would you expose for the highlights but process for the shadows? Yeah, but within limits. You know, okay. you have to apply human judgment, which is also why cameras aren't great at that. I mean, if you've got specular highlights like sun glinting off of water, if you mm -hmm. expose for those, well, just forget it. Yeah. Um, but, but, but yeah, what you're really trying to do is avoid clipping in the highlights of anything that's visually important. And note that qualifying phrase in there, visually important. Uh, you know, specular highlights, you let blow out. Shiny patches on people's faces, yeah, probably they shouldn't blow out. Bad idea. But glints off of glasses, like the ones that most of us are wearing, now we don't care about those. It's all a judgment call. All right, now I'm gonna talk about another cool thing about noise, which is that noise lets you actually see stuff better. And for this, I'm gonna talk about the most fundamental level of noise, which is suppose we had a perfect camera. Well, they exist scientifically, you know, one that records every single photon coming in and it just gets it right every time, 100% efficiency. Well, you know, you're limited because photons, they come in units. There's no such thing as 1.3 photons. It's like 2.3 children. Yeah, not, it doesn't really happen. You know, so a, your sensor can get zero photon or one photon or two photons or three photons, but that's the limit. And that's what the mathematics would tell you, except that's not actually really the case. It doesn't work that way. And let me show you why it doesn't work that way. Let me, let me get the right image up here that I want, okay? So I can switch over. Yeah, all right. Now we're gonna share screen again. Uh, okay, stop share. Now let me get to a new share. I think is that the right one? No, it's not the right one. Uh, yeah, this is the right one. Here we go. All right. Now, as I said, photons don't come in in a regular pattern. They come in in a random pattern. This is what creates 
uh, counting statistic noise or Poisson distribution noise, if you care to look it up. That's like poison spelled with two S's. Uh, and that happens anytime you're counting a small number of events. And this is of real practical significance today because we have a couple of very nice candidates for COVID-19 vaccines and the number of cases of infection in the vaccinated people is very, very low. So we have counting statistic problems. And this is why they're being very careful about how effective they say it is. When you say you've got eight people infected among the vaccinated, which is what Pfizer is saying right now. Well, if you ran the test trial another time, you might get five or you might get 12. It's like flipping a coin. You flip a coin four times, it might come up two heads, two tails but it's more likely to come up one in three. And there's an 8% There's an eight chance, or no, 12% chance it'll come up all heads or all tails. You don't know. Photons work the same way. They obey those statistics. Here's what you're looking at. If this were a magic sensor and we have a light level here, this is the average number of photons per pixel we're talking about up here. So there's zero photons per pixel and there's one photon per pixel. This is actually what a sensor would see. You're, 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 I presume you're all seeing this dark gray checkerboard pattern. Yes. Okay, fine. If this were ideal, all these squares would be black except for this one, which would be a uniform dark gray. It's not because each pixel is getting a random number of photons and you can calculate how many. And I did that to make this pattern. At an average level of half a photon per pixel, you still get some pixels which get photons. You even get some that down at a quarter pixel for photon. I mean, a four, quarter photon per pixel. In terms of simple mathematics and just physics, no, this isn't what you'd see, but it is, it is what you see in real life. Okay, now you're looking at what happens when I actually play with these games. Here's the ideal case. No, no statistics here. Photons come in lockstep. Everything's black until you get to one photon per pixel. And then it's a uniform gray. There's what happens when you inject Poisson noise into it. You're seeing the cursor again yep. now? Yeah. Okay. okay, this would be in that theoretical ideal case where photons and binary counting behave the way the mathematics say. There's no such thing as half a photon. So all these squares over here are black. All the pixels are not receiving any light because there's no such thing as half a photon. And finally, we get up to one photon per pixel and we're happy, we've got a dark gray. Okay, now I'm gonna show you what happens when we put some real statistics into that. So let me stop share again. Okay, switch to the third image. Give me a sec and share screen again. Okay, there we go. There's the same thing oh, wow. with Poisson statistics. You're seeing a bit of, of a crosshatch pattern here because I just tiled the sample from above. I wasn't gonna draw hundreds of thousands of pixels, but this simulates what you'd see in a larger area. And look, we're seeing different gray levels for half a, pixel, half a photon per pixel and a quarter photon per pixel. There's actually different gray levels in there. And it becomes even more pronounced if I were to add in the random noise I did the first time. Noise is a good thing. Noise actually gives you quasi-continuous tone and it gives you information, data, where you would say, theoretically, you shouldn't get any. So comments, questions? Can you this enlarge is, this image? Can I enlarge it? Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Oh, far out. Oops, Absolutely. sorry. Absolutely. That's right. fine. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. There, there's no, there you go. Well, I, like I would argue that controlled noise is a good thing. Uncontrolled noise, not so much. Oh, too much noise is bad. And I actually have another image for that. Um, I'll, I'll switch to that one because it's cool. On the uh, other hand, as it relates to ISO, it's a lot easier to fix noise than it is camera blur. 
yeah. Though we've got so some. If there's a question between getting the shot and not getting the shot, run up the ISO, because today's cameras are just fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. This goes to Jeff's point here, the one I, I think you're seeing a share now. Yep. So there's like 20, 20 share, uh, squares? Yeah. Yeah. And the top is no noise. The second one is a little bit of noise. And there's increasing amounts of random noise injected. And you see it, you know, a little bit of noise is good. Uh, not so good. And a whole lot of noise is really bad. It's, it, you know, you, you, you don't want a lot, but having some, because it's unavoidable anyway in the real world, so you might as well like it, um, is a really good thing. Uh, Jeff's absolutely right about uh, dealing with this. Um, something, a test you can run for yourself is, and uh, astrophotographers do this, which is figuring out if you're doing low light photography, really low light, what's the best ISO to set your camera at? And it's not an obvious thing because you're trading off how the camera amplifies the signal versus how something like Photoshop or ACR will amplify the signal. And it turns out that for most cameras, there will be a sweet spot in there. You make a whole series of photographs at, you know, the same exposure, you know, of, of say of a nighttime sky, you know, starting from ISO 100 going up to umpty zillion, whatever your camera does, you bring them into Photoshop and normalize the skies to the same gr dark gray level that you want. And you'll see there'll be a sweet spot in the middle where the camera's electronics trade off for the Photoshop elect for the Photoshop computation, because the camera electronics know exactly what they're doing, and Photoshop has to make guesses. This is not what you'd expect. You'd always figure, well, I should start with the lowest ISO possible and deal with it in Photoshop. No, but conversely, going to the high end is, doesn't work either. I was very surprised when I ran this experiment. It turned out my camera for that kind of low level work was actually best at ISO 1600 to 3200, and I never would have guessed it was that high. Mind you, there isn't a big difference. It's a pretty shallow curve, but as Jeff said, a little bit of noise, good. A lot of noise, not so good, and it depends on where the noise is coming from. Question. Yeah. Question. So as I look at these, 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 these charts, mm -hmm. uh, what happens in the third and fourth row comes to mind um, Tri-X. Okay. Pushed. It also comes to mind uh, a granularity or a stippling effect that a painter would use such as Surratt mm -hmm. with, with a lot of, lot of bunch of dots. So, so even those, even those third and fourth rows of noise could in fact work to the photographer's advantage, depending on what the photographer wants to do with that noise. Yeah, yeah. if you're Sarah Moon or Bobby Farber, um, uh, grain is good. The other thing that I'll say is that one of the things that I do is I reduce camera noise. And you, you even if you expose at ISO 100, if you increase your exposure in camera raw, you tend to, uh, expose more noise in the shadows. So I run some pretty heavy noise reduction and everybody should be putting at least a little bit of noise reduction in. Thomas does not have uh, luminance noise reduction turned on by default because of the um, computational penalty that is caused by running the noise reduction. Um, a lot of the camera raw defaults unfortunately have been set uh, to make camera raw process faster at default than say capture one or because people were comparing camera raw to other raw processing captures. And if you do computationally intensive um, activity, then you pay a penalty on the slowness. Uh, so one of the things that I do is I apply quite a bit of noise reduction to images that I can see noise and then I go back in and actually apply uh, film grain or noise on top. The difference being I apply smaller noise to break up the artificial smoothness that the noise reduction causes. 
So that, that's kind of a trick. It, it's, it's not very intuitive that you would want to apply noise to an image that you've done noise reduction to, uh, but that actually does work. How much of a difference is there between the no noise that we've just seen and uh, applying film grain? Well, film grain is noise in in digital form. What are they? Are they? Is it same o same o? No, it, it, they'll oh. they'll have different they'll have different uh, frequency and intensity distributions. Yeah. Uh, okay. Simple, simplest version you could think of would be in Photoshop, where you can add noise. You can add Gaussian noise or linear oh. noise, and they look very different. Okay. The people who are doing adding doing film are trying to actually emulate the pattern they would see from film grain. Okay. Uh, I have no idea how successful they are because I've never actually played with that. Uh, something else I wanted to bring up, talking about, as J Jeff said, you know, noise and where you do the computations and all of that. This was a trick I got from, from Jeff. Uh, in terms of getting sharper photographs out, I'm, I'm diverging here, on your printer. Uh, Jeff found out that on the Epson 3800 printer, if you had an image that wasn't at the native resolution of the printer, for the size you want to print out. Say it was 280 pixels uh, per inch instead of 360. You got a sharper result if you ups, up resed it in Photoshop than if you let the printer do it. Um, I've confirmed that's also true with the 3880 and the P900. I don't know how universally true it is, but it goes to the fact that where you make changes makes a difference. Kind of like letting the noise reduction happen in the camera or in Photoshop. It's clear that Photoshop for those three printers, I notice how I'm qualifying this, does a better job of upsampling than the printer does. And back to the comment that um, I think Michael brought up, you don't always want this. Um, I do a lot of infrared work. Sometimes in the infrared work, I have to be suppressing um, no camera noise just because it's an inherently noisy thing. Some photographs of mine look better if I up res them to the native resolution before I print them. Others don't because it makes everything sharper, including the noise. So little noise, good. A lot of noise, not so good. Okay, one more thing I want to get to because um, Jeff brought this up. This is fun. Uh, he was saying it's much easier to deal with um, grain and noise than it is to deal with an unsharp photograph. And he's right. Uh, but the plugins are getting better. And I want yeah. to show you this one just because it's remarkable. This, this, is, this is Topaz, it's Topaz's AI plugins. And they've thrown neural net at this whole problem. Um, okay, are you, are you seeing a picture of a bird? Yes. yes. Okay. The one on the left is the one I made with my camera. Um, I'm going to zoom in uh, really heavily so that you can just see how you know, blurry it is. All right. I couldn't help it. I was in a boat. I could only do so much. All right, you know, it's a long lens. So there's the ospreys in the boat. Uh, in the middle one, I decided to try uh, Photoshop's shake reduction filter, which is still not very good. It just isn't. That's an improvement. I'm getting a lot of artifacts though, and it isn't great. Remember now we're zoomed into like 800%, okay? Way zoomed in. And then I threw uh, Topaz's sharpen AI at it with stabilize. And that's what I got. Man. I don't even know how it does that. <laughs> you know. Well, it's kind of trying to apply a um, deconvolution um, sharpening to a, a motion blur. Uh, and and it, it's basically an unblurring. Uh, now, normal blurring, like what happened with the the space, uh, the Hubble spacecraft mm -hmm. and their telescope, when they put the wrong fucking optics on the telescope, they, they had a built-in blur that they were able to computationally eliminate because they knew the point spread function and that could unblur the blur image. But with camera motion, it's, it's not always in a straight line sometimes it's a little zigzaggy and Photoshop's um, smart sharpen is is limited to only a linear camera blur but the topaz can undo uh, a jerky uh, blur 
and 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 it really is remarkably better than um, well, it's it's better than having your image soft. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would have been nice if I could have gotten it in the first place. And and yeah, trust well, me, trust me, if I print this out uh, as a, as an eleven by fourteen photograph, you can't see any of the artifacts you could see when I zoomed in like that. Uh, and what Topaz has done is thrown a whole bunch of this stuff at, at a neural network, at a learning program to try and figure out, okay, what kind of things should I be looking for? It's doing a really, really dumb version of what we would do visually, which is, you know, we go over here to the first one and I go, and you look at this and you go, okay, I, I know those are twigs down there. I know what twigs look like. Photoshop, all it can do is say, well, I think I know what the blur pattern is. Topaz Labs effectively says, well, I also kind of know what twigs look like, so I can figure out what the de-blurring should look like. Now, is this actually real or not? Which is another argument photographers get into. I don't know, but it looks real to me. And that's honestly all I care about unless I'm doing scientific photography. If I'm doing scientific research, I need to know that the data is actually real. If I'm trying to make a good looking photograph, it only has to look real. Uh, and I just wanted to throw that in as, an as one of the ridiculous things where we're deep into the realm of computational photography now and all the laws of physics kind of go out the window. I'll also put a plug in for Topaz's Gigapixel. Uh, I've got a lot of early um, digital captures that are in the three, six, eight megapixel range. And Gigapixel uh, actually does a, a scary good uh, upsampling. I have a sample for that also. That was the first one of theirs I used. Um, this is a small section of a photograph. Um, and I upsampled it in, in Photoshop to the native resolution of my printer. Again, thank you, Jeff. And I also upsampled it in Gigapixel. And let me zoom out a little so you can see both of them. Uh, it depends on how big a monitor you have, which is why I zoomed in. This is the Photoshop upsampling. This is the Gigapixel upsampling. And this is one of the most spectacular examples I've seen. There are details in there that I can't even tell if they're real or if Gigapixel invented them, but they look real. Um, I'm gonna zoom in really tight and then scroll up and down because I'm trying to show you stuff and it's a little hard on monitors. Okay, so, uh, and I don't know how to do multiple windows if possible. So there's that, there's a pebble up there. You, you see that pebble that's on the tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the same pebble down there. We're now at like 1600% understand. We're way, way, cool. way, way in. Um, everything, I can believe everything there is real, but we've got little structural details in here that aren't really visible in the Photoshop version. I'm seeing lots of structure in here. Did Gigapixel invent that? Was it really there and they extracted it? The same way ACR, yes. pulled, the, the way ACR pulled out the cables in the first photograph? I don't actually have any way of knowing. I also don't particularly care. <laughs> It yeah. is made up, it is synthetic, but it's synthetic in a way that is realistic as opposed to um, uh, plasticky. Yeah. How do, how do we know it's synthetic, Jeff? Well, because <laughs> you, when you add pixels from nothing, you have oh. to make shit up. Okay. And also, I honestly think in here, the amount of information is so low that it has to be making stuff up. Yeah, that's a, that's but that's a judgment call. Um, yeah. uh, it's sort of like in that. Remember back to my ACR example where we started with. I wouldn't. I don't know how ACR was able to derive the pattern of those cables. I don't see it in the fast raw viewer, but they were real, and ACR did. So you know, maybe this is real. Jeff and I have no way of knowing. Um, because one of the things about these um, neural no, networks- No, it is science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> and when and you of... add pixels from nothing, you're making shit up, but you're it just making it up in a very smart, intelligent way, as opposed to a pure mathematical way. 
right. And you might actually be making real shit up. Yeah, you don't that's know. true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other things like the patterns in the bark, I'm, I'm quite convinced most of those are real because that's really what it looks like close up. But again, if you get subtle enough and close enough, I bet some of it isn't. I bet some of it is just invented. Again, for, for those of you, um, you know, looking at these who haven't used these plugins, these are two of the most spectacular examples I have of how these plugins work. Uh, it, it, your mileage may differ. I've also found cases where, where Sharpen AI just doesn't work well at all. I've also found cases where Gigapixel made very little, if any, improvement. Most of the time, they do really great things. Uh, this is also an area where everybody's going to improve. At the moment, Adobe is way behind Photoshop, uh, way behind Topaz on this. And it's worth noting they've hired some real computational experts in the past couple of months and are building a whole team to work on this because they realize this is the wave of the future. Um, you're going to start to see images improved in ways that you're going to think are real, except it's not just physics and it's not simple mathematics. Uh, here's another example. Look at the details down there in the shadows, which is pretty mushy and blurry here. Um, there's what Gigapixel did to it. It reduced the noise. It pulled out striations that I genuinely believe are there. Uh, I think, I, I, well, I think I, that's kind of it. I've, I've already shown you how your whole world is not anywhere as simple as you thought it was. Uh, you know, it's, so does anyone uh, in the audience have questions about anything? Yeah, questions, anything, yeah. Well, my takeaway on this whole thing is I'm going back to film. <laughs> <laughs> right, because photochemistry is so much simpler and more understandable. Yeah. Okay, right. Thank you, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, At least now we fight over which raw converter to use instead of which black and white developer to use. I, yeah. I have one question. Sure. Mm -hmm. What the hell made you want to do um, write a sci-fi book with um, <laughs> uh, with with John Camp? Okay. Um, because he browbeat me into it. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you the quick story because it, it, it is funny. Um, I met John through the online. You should explain this. Uh, oh. um, John Sanford is a novelist that writes basically crime detective no novels quite successfully, but he's also a very avid photographer. I met him online at the Luminous Landscape when he actually uh, signed on and used his John Camp name. Uh, John, John Camp is his actual name. Um, the, uh, but the pen name is John Sanford. And I was confused as hell because he was talking about his new book coming out. And it's like, <laughs> wait, John Camp, are you John Sanford? And, and uh, we actually compared notes on being authors, um, but you know, I'm, I'm not a fiction writer. Well, some of my book is fiction, but mostly it's not intended to be fiction. Yes. Uh, but when, when, when I found out that Satan and, and John Camp collaborated to write a sci-fi book, now, to be honest, I've got it. I have not read it, but now that I've, I've, this is burbled up back into my conscious, I'm going to have to go read it. You have it, you don't have to read it. You don't even have to like it. We sold the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be sorry. Yeah, I met, I met yeah, uh, by the way, the, the two names are not a secret. He used Sanford because he had published earlier books as John Camp and his publisher wanted something to distinguish them. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a pseudonym as much as just a different pen name. Um, I met John in a similar fashion through Mike Johnston's The Online Photographer, where he was a regular commenter and an occasional columnist. And uh, it turned out I was going back to Minneapolis on a vacation. Uh, John used to live in the Twin Cities area, and I mentioned I wouldn't be posting for a couple of weeks. John said, hey, why don't you get together and we'll meet face to face? And it turned out we really liked each other. 
We became really good friends. Every time I went back there, we'd get together, have dinner. John kept beating on me saying, you know, Katine, you should write fiction. There's a whole lot of money to be made writing fiction. By the way, I have witnesses to these arguments. <laughs> you, know, you know, a sweetie of mine was there to hear this. He's going, you could make a shitload of money writing fiction. I said, John, I don't want to write fiction. He says, yeah, but there's a lot of money to be made. I said, I live in Silicon Valley. I know all the hackers and geeks. If I wanted to make a whole lot of money doing something I don't want to do, I've got other ways to do it. Yeah, but you'd be good at it. No, I wouldn't. I don't know how to do it. You could learn. I don't want to. It's hard work. Fiction, you have to make shit up. Nonfiction's easy. You're just reporting the facts in an entertaining fashion. Or as Jeff said, you hope you're reporting the facts. <laughs> you know, um, but fiction, you have to make stuff up and that's hard work. And we had these arguments and finally John gave up trying, you know. And then he hits me a couple of years later saying, you know, that science fiction novel I've been working on, he'd been working on one for several years. And I said, and he said, yeah, it's not working for me. Uh, there's just too much hard problems for me to solve. I like my stuff to be accurate. And I'd have to spend four or five years researching all this stuff. And I don't have the time because I'm turning out two novels a year. And I'd still make bonehead mistakes. And he really does. John used to turn out two bestsellers every year. And every one of them was a New York Times bestseller. He's got like 40 of them. Half of them went to number one. He was, he was just a machine. He's, I say was because he's wound back now. He's taking more time for himself. So he says to me, Katine, here's what I want to do. Now, hear me out. Let me finish all of this. You know, I want you to write the novel. And I said, no. Why should I hear him out? He's a friend. <laughs> I don't have to hear him out. So he said, no, let me send you what I got because these, these problems I can't solve. Like I've got this space station and I need to get to Saturn. And, and I said, fine, send me the stuff. I won't even promise to look at it. He said, look. There's, there's no pressure here. There's no issues. I'm working on other stuff. You're going to get to write the whole dr first draft yourself. You know, you don't have to have me, you know, you know, nagging you at every step of the way. And uh, I don't even have a contract for this yet. So because I didn't know if I'd get it done. So we're not on any kind of a deadline. So what I'm thinking to myself is, so you're telling me, John, I'm going to do all the heavy lifting and we don't have any money yet. You are not selling this. Anyway, he sent me the stuff. I went to sleep that night. I woke up the next morning and realized I'd solved one of the hard engineering science problems he, that had stumped him. And at that point, I was probably stuck. So I started writing and discovered, well, what do you know? I don't like writing fiction, but I can do it. <laughs> and like Jeff, Jeff's written for a ton of magazines, you know, so have I. We, one of the things you learn to do, and John does when you write for magazines, is you learn to write to style. You learn to write the way the editors want to hear you write because otherwise they're going to blue pencil you to death or just throw you away. So I read John's style, read a couple of his books, said, oh yeah, I can manage that. Developed a style that was 80% his and 20% mine because he's got the big market. John looked over my shoulder. I did the first draft. John rewrote it. I took it back, unrewrote part of it. We argued a little bit, not really. We had a great time. It went to a couple of back and forths. We sent it to the publisher and I got a novel published. And what do you know? I'm a New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? You know, so that's, that's what happened. That's how that book got written. And no, we're not planning a sequel uh, because one, we don't have a good idea for one and B, both of us don't really like sequels. Usually they're written by authors who don't want to let go of their of the clever toy they built. So, you know, we'd have to have a really good idea for a sequel if we were going to write a sequel. But we may write together at some point again in the future because we both had a blast doing it, even if I hate writing fiction. Jim's asking I, if you made any money on it. Oh, um, I don't mind mentioning that. John says I don't mind. I got three quarters of a million dollars. That's not bad. No, That's actually... Okay. That, Actually, almost eight hundred thousand with 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 secondary sales and rights. That's more than I got for my books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more than I got on any of my others. Um, yeah, when you're a best-selling author like John is, the publisher gives you a really big advance. Um, this was actually considerably smaller than his normal advance uh, because it was not part of the series, and the series books always sell better. So it was just not to show you that that both sex and fiction sells. <laughs> yes. 
And, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you something. John says that's what thrillers are all about. He says they're all romances. So I said, you know, even science fiction ones. So I said to him, so you mean the real story is, you know, boy meets girl, boy and girl get together, aliens invade, disaster ensues, boy loses girl, aliens are defeated, boy finds girl again. And he said, yeah, that's pretty much the formula. <laughs> so that that totally kills a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, well, it depends on how much your pictures sell for. <laughs> um, now, we're, now he's talking fiction. <laughs> okay, okay, I got to think now. A thousand words. Um, yeah, yeah. If that picture, doesn't count inflation. No, it doesn't count inflation. Um, yeah, I got about five. I got about six dollars a word for this, which is even better than I got for writing nonfiction for the good magazines. Uh, yeah. But you know, if your pictures sell for more than five or six thousand dollars, a picture is worth a thousand words or more. All right, so there's the answer to that question. Do we have any other questions? Any, any physics questions? Any photography questions? Yes. I I got another question. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, what do you think about this uh, whole brouhaha that is going on in the landscape photography realm about this artificial sky? Well, uh, Nuller, you're pointing at me. Um, basically, you know, Luminar and now Photoshop is going to have sky replacement. Uh, and in the grand scheme of things, a lot of the landscape photographer of the year uh, the um, winning entries were heavily um, uh, manipulated and uh, with multiple image combinations and fake skies put in, as well as heavy handed, what I would call bad retouching. Uh, but I just wondered what you thought about this whole thing of, uh, a lot of it is like Instagram or Snapseed type of make an image look much better than it has any right to look. Okay, that's totally a judgment call for everybody. I would say there's a, there's for me there there's a bright shining line between uh, compositing and modifying. For me, that's just a hard line. Uh, you don't add elements that weren't there before. Now you may occasionally erase elements. I have been known to take a telephone line out of a photograph. I really have. I will do that. Does on Stephen occasion. Johnson know that? <laughs> I don't know, but we're good friends. So I think yeah. he'll, he'll tolerate it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but, then, wait, but then go back to the shot of the driftwood and the, and the pebble. All right. Mm -hmm. That, so, so the, the, um, what do you call it? You know, what the, what the wood with the, uh, grain, uh, no, not the grain. It, 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 it's actually, it's actually um, age lines. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the rings. And, and, the rings. And the rings. And then what, what was in the nothing of the pebble? So now, now, now the AI is putting something in there that you, that we as humans didn't see in the original shot. We don't know if it was there in the original shot. This is the, the problem that Jeff and I talked about is we don't actually know. We suspect not, but we don't actually know. Um, when I but say, it, but when I say compositing, when I say don't put, insert anything that wasn't there, I'm talking about big things like skies. Oh. Uh, you know, if, if you do noise reduction or if you do edge sharpening, edge sharpening in particular, or you run any sharpen program, you're adding things that weren't there but they're on the small level. It's not like say adding a bird. It's not like I put the osprey into the sky there um, or, or replace the sky. For me, that's just my personal hard line is that I, I don't think compositing is legit. On the, other hand, on the other hand, I've built my whole career about trying to produce photographs that look like what I saw. And that's what people expect from me. That's my particular aesthetic. Um, what I saw back to the psychophysical comments is a very subjective thing. But for me, that's my goal in photography. And if and all of you who've been doing photography so long know that's actually incredibly hard because the camera doesn't see things the way we do, not even close. 
but then but then there are two points but mm -hmm. then you're looking at it from a photojournalistic point of view that what what was there in front of you you record what about the photographer that says i want to create something in my mind but what jeff was bringing up was the case of landscape photographers okay um, uh, and, and what he's saying there is there's a there's a really interesting debate there you can have, which apparently they're having, over where do you place that line? Uh, at what point have you gone, you know, it, HDR even raised those issues. There are people who use HDR to drive photographs into wonderfully artistic effects that don't look anything like reality. And then there are a bunch of us who also use it so subtly that you would never actually know that HDR was even being applied. Um, also, the same thing with panoramic stitching, also mm -hmm. focus bracketing. I mean, synthetic photography or computational photography, the, the, the point is, I guess, at what point is the attempt to attain a realistic or reliable rendering of what you see, or as opposed to create a rendering of what you wish you saw? That's right. One is kind of realistic based and the other is kind of fantasy based or fiction based. And, and, and technology is making it harder and harder to be yep. able to clearly draw that line. Um, at some point it becomes arbitrary, it becomes arbitrary rules. Um, even if you have the rules, you apply them arbitrarily. Uh, a lot of contests now have rules that basically say no major manipulations. And now you have to define what major means. You know, most of us think dodging and burning in, for example, is just fine. And a little bit of HDR is just going to be fine. Where do you draw the line? And the answer well, is there is not no if line. you're a photojournalist. No, if you're a photojournalist, absolutely not. Uh, and the answer is there is no line. That's aesthetics. Well, Photo that, photojournalists, let me finish. Photojournalists, right. I draw a really hard line. You mess with as little as possible if you're a photojournalist. Um, the, 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 what you should be doing as a photojournalist is thinking, is the change I'm making going to be significant to any viewer? And if it is, you don't do it. You know, there's a very famous photographer, mm -hmm. and I'll mention his name, Arnold Newman, yes, right, whose very famous quote was, nothing matters except the final image. Would it, however you whatever you needed to do prior to making that final image doesn't matter. The final image is, is, is the all important thing. But the, it's, but the purpose of that image does matter. To who? If you're, if, you, if you're trying to do quote, realistic landscape photography or competing in that competition, you have a very different set of criteria than if you're a photojournalist or if you're doing scientific oh. photography or if you're doing portraiture. The image is what matters, but the, the aesthetic and ethical objectives are very different in each well, case. That, 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 but that depends on the, the area of photography that you're in. Photojournalism, no. Scientific, no. But everything else besides those two, or astrophysics, no. All right. But, but everything else, I mean, who cares if you decided to put a cloud in a, in a cloudless sky if it enhances the overall look of the image. If you're in a competition with other photographers, yeah. it may matter. Competitions are arbitrary. You set rules. Okay. The rules are arbitrary. But do you think that the rules should begin to be altered as we progress technologically into all this new stuff that's, that, that, that's, that, that's here as a tool for the image maker? Well, they are being altered because because the, because the goalposts keep moving. Okay. Uh, I'd like to kick in here. Yes, sure. thanks, Barry. This is my real face, not my <laughs> Hi, dog. <Barry. laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, I think I, I teach professional practices. I used to teach a college class. Now I do workshops, and we run into this. It's really the culture that decides what's real and what isn't. You know, when the 35 millimeter camera first came out, people said, well, these aren't real images because they're not made by a technical camera where you have an expert, only an expert could use it. So if ordinary people are taking pictures, it's not the real thing. So the culture really 
decides what it is. When you look at certain kinds of advertising images that come right out of uh, uh, look like Instagram, it's because so many photo editors, uh, both editorial and advertising, are looking at Instagram. And they're going, well, this is the look. So then it becomes acceptable. And I think even the New York Times, which had, you know, has pretty strict rules, uh, uh, dodging, burning, cropping, little color correction, that's really about it. Um, you could see, I've seen images on the New York Times that I wouldn't have thought they would ever run five or six years ago, but have become okay. Many of the people here right now are old enough to remember when there was a big debate in news photography over whether color was acceptable, nice. whether, whether it distracted from the important elements. Not that old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am. I remember that. Um, it, was a legitimate, it was a legitimate debate, which goes to what Barry's saying. Uh, the whole thing about professionals with professional cameras as opposed to everybody else, you know, honestly, that ship sailed when the slogan, you press the button, we do the rest, came about. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, you know, the, yes, there's a certain core of, and I will call them elitists in a negative way because, heck, I'm an elitist. But these are the ones who think it's still this narrow little camp that they own. And that disappeared with Kodak. Photography has been the premier folk art form for over a hundred years. It just is. And, you know, people live with that. And that also affects, by the way, the rules of the contest, Michael, because who is the contest directed towards? You know, who's the, who's, who's the photographers? Yes. But what does that mean? Are well, these that, well, that begs the question, what then is a professional photographer? But these no, aren't animal. animal. I would okay. suggest it's the audience that matters, not the photographer. And the audience for those contests are not necessarily just photographers. It's who buys landscape photography. Well, they're all, they're, wait, they're wait, all, but, but landscape photographers don't buy landscape photos. No, but somebody does. I do. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. They don't care. They just want a pretty picture. I, I would also point out that a lot of the, uh, you know, we're to, you know, the Instagram stuff is coming from people who actually are professional. They're what they call influencers, which is a whole new thing. You know, influencers, they're professionals. The Instagram look and similar filter looks are in. These are professionals. They're doing an aesthetic that, you know, makes me want to personally rip out my hair, but I don't have to look at it <laughs> and I don't have to buy it. Yeah. Um, I'm not prepared to say they're not professional. I am. Well, what? Oh, I, okay. I am too. <laughs> and well, no, the, the, the and thing all photography was plunged into war yet again. <laughs> um, the thing that drives me nuts is when you do over the top retouching that is obviously on the surface fake um, and trying to pass that off as real, I think is an injustice to uh, all the digital imaging artists that know what the fuck they're doing. Um, when I do multi-image combinations, which I don't do as much as I used to, but I take a great deal of pride in doing it in such a way that nobody could figure out that I did it. Uh, and if that is accurately done, if my reality is real enough that it can't be deduced as fantasy, then my job uh, is successful. Uh, and images that I post sometimes have added skies, sometimes don't. But if I add a sky, it's going to be damn impossible for even an expert to tell that I added it because uh, I often go around and shoot a lot of skies and I make sure the sun's coming from the right direction, the quality of the light matches, and, and I do all the things. Whereas Luminar, I mean, when they put some of the artificial skies in, it's like, well, that looks like shit. But yeah. the level of acceptance <laughs> of how bad ex uh, something is accepted uh, in large measure because of the Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter um, environment, uh, when you're looking at a small little image, uh, you can't necessarily tell uh, a lot of detail. And so the authenticity or the uh, realistic looking kind of doesn't matter. 
which I think is one of the problems that we're facing in a media world, as opposed to looking at a 30 by 40 print. Uh, yeah. If you looked at those images big, you would tell that, that, that they're actually very poorly done. And this is not a new problem. Uh, no. They it, had the problem in the turn of the century with the pictorialists. Yep. And, 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 fuzzy and, pictures were romantic. Yeah, and the, and the huge battle between between the photo impressionists and the F sixty four school, which yeah. which got so heated that the F sixty four school effectively erased the photo impressionists from the canon <laughs> for for probably thirty or forty years. You know, you went you researched photography and you just never even heard about them. It was really vicious. Um, as as fakery has always been a problem. Uh, honesty has always been a problem. Uh, a wonderful little, little a wonderful little anecdote here, how far back it goes. Uh, those photographs of the San Francisco earthquake, 1906 earthquake, which show the, the, the uh, bu buildings in downtown burning. You've seen those photographs, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. down Street, the tall, tall buildings with the smoke coming up from them. Yeah. Those are fakes. Are they really? They're complete fakes. The San Francisco city fathers and the robber barons did them to steal money from the insurance companies back east because they had insurance against fire and they did not have insurance against earthquakes. Those buildings fell down in the earthquakes. It was the residential areas, the outer lying districts, which all burnt. Those big stone buildings, they just fell down. Well, so they, they had committed... iPhones. They couldn't have gotten away with it. <laughs> yeah. So they committed fraud. And people were so used to seeing photos retouched then and enhanced because you had to. They were frequently crappy that no one even looked closely or thought about this. Um, so there's no, a case. There's a no. case absolutely where it was completely unethical. And but you know we're talking California robber barons. You know they'll now, do anything. I, gotta, I want to tell you something. That we're we're almost doing this now for uh, two hours. And in oh, the, oh, good it, grief. Okay. Doesn't matter. But in the short amount of time, and I really mean this seriously, in the short amount of time that we've, that I've met you, and I, I really think that you're incredible, all right? You have fucked up my mind so much. <laughs> that it's, to quote oh, Jeff good. Dewey, oh, good. I am really <laughs> fucked up in terms of everything that you just showed and talked about has now done a 180 degree turn in my in my cerebellum and, and my work and, here is and, done <laughs> and i and i kind of i kind of like you because of that <laughs> well you i think the, the i think I, th I think the most fun thing in the world it, personally actually is finding out i'm wrong about something at this point because then it means i get to learn something new mm -hmm. are you married nope well, then get married. You'll find out what all the things that you're wrong about. Oh, I have plenty of partners. I'm just not married. Oh, oh, oh. well, uh, you know, I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been living with the same person for 40 years. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Any, anyway, um, on, let me get a sip of tea. Yeah. Let me just shut this. My son's dog. Oh, oh ap apropos being a writer, uh, this was given to me by my other significant other. <laughs> my favorite teacup <laughs> because it's so true i missed the last line on it it, it says i'm a writer not a serial killer <laughs> yep i got it <laughs> <laughs> well as as michael said we're almost two hours here um but are I'm, there any other questions yeah other questions oh, wait, wait, don't, don't cut him off no my son's dog is barking in the background uh, for babysitting. Uh, so, do you teach photography this way? Physically, no, I haven't. I've always done it through articles and books. Um, I, I'll mention this, it hasn't been anywhere. Uh, uh, Charlie Kramer and I are old friends. And now that Bill Atkinson has retired from the workshop route, I've asked Charlie if 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 he want if if maybe he'd want to do workshops with me, uh, and he says he doesn't even know what he's going to be doing in the future. None of us do. Nobody uh, does. No, nobody does. Uh, 
And that would actually be the first time I would be doing teaching in person, except for very occasionally I've done workshops uh, on photo retouching, uh, sorry, photo restoration, things like that. But pretty much, no, it's all been on paper. So why don't you do uh, I, I, I like I like writing and I get to monologue on paper. It's a lot of fun. Do you like doing this? Would you, would you do this again? Oh, sure. Well, why be, don't you I'd... do it this way? You see more people. <laughs> And you can get and you get the fuck up their brains too, which, <laughs> which everybody which, needs. Which which everybody needs, including me. Yeah. And you know, and I get to you know see people I know, and uh, I get to talk with Jeff, who I think, God, the last time we actually ever met face to face was back when there were photo trade shows. It must have been like yeah. 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know. So no, this is this is fun. Um, yeah, I mean, Katan, you and I have known each other since probably the mid 80s. And I think we've only met in person once. And that was about 20 years ago. Maybe you yeah. came up to Seattle for a science fiction show or something. Yeah, that's yeah, I, I mean, I, I honestly need to say again that this has been a I don't want to say a catharsis, but <laughs> but damn close to it. It messed with your head. Messing well, with was, is good. No, as she would say, I'm fucked up anyway. So, so you know, I, I, I this, if anything, this has made me more, uh, a little more Abby normal. <laughs> That's all. Which is very good. Which is good for visual artists or, or all artists. I think we need that. We, we need more of that in our society someone to tell everybody you don't know what the hell you're talking about try it another way <laughs> this is what you've done at least to me so i thank you for that you're welcome yes, I, we, all, we all thank you i've had fun doing it uh, any other questions or comments before we put an end to this <laughs> what's your favorite f stuff <laughs> <laughs> f you <laughs> <laughs> knew that was <laughs> oh good I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're ending on a high note yeah. yes yeah. so <laughs> on monday i'm going to be back here with my friend nate gowdy um nate is a photojournalist here in seattle who's been traveling with the flow with the um presidential campaigns uh both the last one and this year so he's going to have his stories from the road of getting in trouble with different campaigns that he's tried to photograph um so it should be some interesting <laughs> stories from him Oh, I should also mention, you know, I'm always happy to try and address questions by email. Um, I've got about a 95% success rate on actually answering email. Um, I won't promise better than that. But, you know, if, you know, feel free to dig up my email address. I'm not really not hard to find online. It, you know, kind of like Jeff, our names are pretty identifiable and you can find me pretty easily. You know, no John Doe here. <laughs> uh, Is there a first name for you? No, I only have one name. I have one legal name, Katine. Okay. It makes it makes signing checks really easy. <laughs> also made it also made it really easy when I had to sign umpteen zillion copies of Saturn Run. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I'd hate to be John Cornicello and have to sign a couple <laughs> thousand books. <laughs> right, right. Uh, exactly. It, it, yeah, my it, signature changed considerably when I started signing prints for Epson at their trade show booth, you know, after about 20 prints, 25, 30 prints, Cramps. my hand would crap up. So I actually came up with a signature that was very easy to do and repeatable without a lot of muscle cramping. John Camp did the same thing. Um, yeah. If you ever get one, buy one of his autographed books, which you can do through things like Poison Pen, it's sort of a glyph. It's actually his initials but it's something he can do and he can do thousands of them without ruining his hand. And since he's had to do that twice a year. Uh, and I also what... discovered that your legal signature and your print signature should never be the same. Oh, well, that's a problem because... for me because they do look the same. <laughs> well, you should change it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, why I, I, why I get... is that? No, wait, wait. Forgery. Yeah. Forgery. Forgery. Get you point. don't want somebody to be able to forge your legal signature. Okay. Now, now wait a minute. When you say the legal signature versus the print signature. Well, like when I voted by mail and I had to go look up 
and see how I signed my driver's license because that was what it was going to be compared against. Yeah, but wait a minute. When you say print signature, do you mean print as signing in a, a photograph? Yeah, signing a print. Yeah. Yeah. Signing so a photographic you, print. So do you do it in a script? No, but my signature for a print is different than, although I don't write checks hardly at all anymore because, mm -hmm. well, PayPal. Uh, but um, no, w when I do a legal signature, it's different than the signature that I write on a print. And it really freaked me out because they, they uh, for the election, they were saying that they were going to do a very careful comparison of signatures for um, um, mail-in ballots to the legal signature that they have on file, which is basically your, your driver's license. So I, I had to check my driver's license so that I could recreate my signature because, you know, I had no, when you sign for your license and they print it onto your license, that's what they're comparing. And I didn't want, I wanted and, my and, vote to count, God damn and it. You, and you've retrained your hand to write your print signature. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, wait, but, but Jeff, when you are going to sign a print, uh -huh. do you sign it as in, in script or do you do, you do no, block it's, letters? No, it's, it's written. It's like a script. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's different than. Okay than my okay. legal signature. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Newler got uh, confused way back when, when Gutenberg uh, changed fonts. Uh, he <laughs> yeah, had the problem. That's exactly. I, I wanted to know what happened to their serifs. I, 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 I didn't <laughs> know what the hell he did with all those serifs that I was saving. Okay. So I, had to mark, I yeah, thought I had the market, the market quartered on serifs. And then they um, came out with one Helvetica. One question, Satan, about yeah, here, here, there, there you go. go. Here's the way I sign my prints, and that's pretty much my real signature, mm -hmm. except for the yeah. date part. So yeah, I've got this problem going. Yeah. Oh well, wait. All right, I just want to take a screen capture. Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, you got another article coming up on online photographer. You um, something to look for? I don't know. Um, in truth, Mike's been getting very behind and somewhat forgetful on these things. Um, in theory, I have one in the can. Um, actually, it was the next part of the die transfer autobiography, and it's been in the can for months and months, and periodically I remind him about it. He says, oh, yeah, I remember. Um, I, 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 I don't mean like there's an interpersonal problem. You know, he's not blowing me off, but he seems to have... Um, been running into some uh, production and scheduling issues. So I honestly don't know. I yeah. think there may be one coming up soon because I'm going to do one for my newsletter. Uh, my Christmas one's going to be on statistics this year because it's a very popular topic right now. And he might want to pick that one up. So I honestly can't say it's kind of in Mike's hands. I, by the way, I'm not the only one who's, who's run into this. So I, I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah. He's playing a lot of pool, I think. So, hey, so you have a newsletter? Uh, yeah, um, you can subscribe to it by going to my website and there'll be a link for clicking on it. All right, John, will, will you put his website on the- uh... Oh, it's really easy, katine.com. C-T-E-I-N, yeah. C-T-E-I-N.com. Can... I'm going to go to you for therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm going to stop the recording. We can hang out for a few moments later, but I want to thank Katine sure. for the time today. This has been really a lot of fun. Yeah, very yeah. informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you to we'll all of you. Next time. Thank, thank you very much.